So this is the second video in the FPGA driven LCD series um, where we're learning how to program uh, an FPGA to display stuff on an LCD. Um, this works out to be just kind of a simple display, but it gives you the idea. Um, so if you haven't seen the first video and you're interested in the products that we use and, and some of the, um, the introductory stuff, if you will, some of the stuff that we use to, to get to this point um, and just kind of an overall intro to the series, then uh, go back to that first video and watch it. Otherwise, um, we'll go ahead and move on to the uh, second part of the series. So the FPGA that I chose for this project um, was the Mojo V3. I think it's still selling out there. Um, the guy has a great website. I'll link it down below. I think it's uh, Embedded Micro. I learned a lot from that website. I hope that he doesn't mind that I'm referencing his product here because, uh, I mean, it's it's an awesome product. It is not um, it is not the full complete set of everything. I went with this because I was a student and it was the least expensive option, but it was also something where I could learn all sorts of stuff. So I had to put the hardware down. I had to learn how to do pull ups and pull downs and you know all the different stuff that had to be done. It wasn't done for me on a big multi multi faceted board. Basically, this thing has a few things on it so that you can kind of get started and then you want to add stuff to it. I'm sure that he's built hats and stuff for that. In fact, I know that he's built some hats and stuff for this thing where you can plug them in on top. Um, so you can kind of do a modular approach, you know, not spend so much money the in the first shot because these FPGA boards today, my goodness, they're expensive. I bought a few for work and uh, I don't think that I would be buying them uh, personally for a little while. Um, I'd really, I really like some of those RF boards that they've got coming out. Anyways, I digress. Um, this Mojo FPGA board is what I chose. Um, it worked great for me. It could work great for a lot of you, but um, just realize there's a caveat there that you're going to have to learn a lot about hardware um, if you want to drive or, or work with any hardware. You're going to have to learn how to set that stuff up to be able to be done, which is what we do with the LCD in this one. So even if you are coming from a, a multifaceted uh, board, and you want to drive an, an LCD, you can use a lot of this code. Uh, some of this project will be going over a little bit about hooking up the, the LCD. Um, if there's a demand for how do you how do you get this this hardware set up, um, then I'll make a separate video for that. This is more about the FPGA. Um, so yeah, use the Mojo FPGA for this one. And uh, it has a Xilinx Spartan 6 on it. I think we'll go over that a little bit more here in a second. Yeah, here we go. So the Mojo V3 has a Spartan F or Spartan 6 FPGA on it. Um, it's got 84 digital I/O pins, which is phenomenal for me. Um, I'm actually working with a board at work that you have to, you know, you, you have all these new setups where, um, you know, you have a, a special header that you have to access that header to get to all the I/O pins. There's tons of I/O on on uh, these FPGAs, but just to get to it these days, you've got to have special headers and stuff in there, of course ridiculously expensive. So this is nice. It's got 84 digital IOs on it, all pulled out so you can get to them. Um, it's got eight analog inputs, eight general purpose LEDs, which is what we use in this project to kind of figure things out, figure out the project to get started. Um, then a reset button, uh, LCD to show when the display or when the FPGA is correctly configured, which is important. Um, and then, so an AT mega uh, microcontroller is used to configure the FPGA and to do the USB communications and uh, read the analog pins and stuff like that. Um, and then there's on onboard flash memory to store the FPGA uh, configuration file. It's kind of especially these days going to be considered a total bare bones sort of board. Um, I don't know that I'd consider it that, uh, but yeah, yeah. So you've got just a few things on the output uh, side to be able to kind of get you started to where you're going. There's enough to get the thing programmed, uh, and there's enough to to store actual flash memory so that you can, can so that you can get the, the FPGA configured on the fly, right? So if it's set up and, and running, um, it, and it can pull from that stored memory and uh, go from there. So if you want to know more about the Mojo V3 itself, I encourage you to go to the website. I think it's Embedded Micro. Like I said, I'll put the link below. Uh, look at the the FPGA. Go through the guy's got some awesome tutorials on there. He's actually got some YouTube videos that he goes through some of the stuff. 
Um, I often find myself referring to that website just because I forget a little thing that I'd learned and I'm like, oh, I know exactly where that's at. That's uh, in his tutorials there. I'm not sure if his tutorials are still up. Um, I might go check that after this video, um, but I will give a link below. The first task, obviously, was to light up a, an LED on that FPGA board. Um, so this is kind of the code to go through and do that. It's, it's fairly simple. Of course, if you've never worked with uh, any of this HDL stuff, then it may just be a little um, of an eyesore because you're not sure what everything means. Um, but so we start out with uh, just naming our module. Um, we give our inputs and outputs. In this case, we're just going to input the clock and we're going to output to these seven LEDs. I just wanted to light up one. That was my objective. So I, I took the bank. Uh, if you see a sign LED seven down to four, um, that's just, or seven colon four means seven down to four. That's just me saying, I want all these from seven down to four to be a zero. And then I assigned LED three, one bit to be one. And then I assigned LEDs two down to zero to be zero. So this, this kind of uh, language here with the uh, B um, apostrophe, or sorry, let's say four apostrophe B zero. So what that means is I want four bits of zero. Uh, and then if you got one apostrophe B one, I want one bit of one. Then three apostrophe B zero is I want three bits of zero. Um, and there's there's a few different ways to, to write your your um, bits and or hex. You know you could use hex or or uh, decimal or bitwise um, as you write these. So just basically open the module, turn the turn the one LED on and the rest off, and then close the module, and that just turns on that that one LED right there. Um, so the next thing to do was to use an external push button to turn the lights on and off or to turn certain lights on and off or, or whatever or what have you. Um, so for this, we're going to kind of quickly go through the net list. This is the net list, like I say, for the Mojo V3. Um, most net lists, you can find the net list for the board online if you're using ISC. With, um, with Vivado, you can, it's, it's totally different the way you, you manage the net list. Um, I like this way. It's clean. It's easy. There's less abstract going on. I just go into my net list and find you know the proper pin, cross-reference it, name it or label it whatever I want it to be. Um, but with uh, Vivado, there's uh, it's a it's a whole different setup. So you have to go and uh, and find that uh, that sort of or find a video for that if you're working with Vivado. Um, it probably still has a net list. In fact, I'm sure it still has a net list. Um, but the way they do it. The way they save these things and stuff like that. Maybe I'll do a video for that um, later on if that's a, another thing that you guys request. But for this, you know, it's just going through and saying I have a, a location of 134 and I want to call that LED zero. And then we just name it on up LED zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I name one for the button. Now these are specific to the board itself because these are where the, the actual. Um, switches and LEDs are traced on the board to the actual FPGA. So the net list up there up top, I actually pulled that maybe from, probably actually from the, actually I did, I pulled that from the embedded micro website. Um, he's got a generic net list there and you can kind of pull that down, save it or go to your net list in ISC, replace it and change, uh, and it changes to what you need it to be. Or you can go through and change each, each one the way you need it to be. Um, so the code for this actually wasn't too bad at all. Um, I just assigned the LEDs six down to zero. Of course, I used the same input output uh, language as in the last slide. Um, and then I just assigned LEDs six down to zero um, to be zeros. So there's seven bits of zero there. Um, and then for LED seven, I assigned that to equal button not, right? So not button. Um, and of course, button, if you look at the net list above, is located to, so I basically, you're just giving it a variable name. Um, so when it sees button, it's going to look for P90 or pin 90. And I'm, I'm basically saying that I want LED to be not of what pin 90 is. Um, and that's what that um, tilde is there. Um, so 
essentially when you when you have this code set up the way you have it or the way it is here when I push the button it turns on the LED um, now it's a not because it's an inverse button alright so when the button is up the light will be off which means when the button is up there's actually a voltage on there when the button is down there's no voltage on there so there must be a pull-up resistor on there that's holding the voltage up and then you short it to ground so because it's reverse logic, I, I reverse that logic with the tilde and I made a nod in there. Um, if you just take the tilde out, it's just reverse, right? Like if I'm not touching the button, the light will be on, and I touch the button to turn the light off. Um, so no big deal there. And here's what we're talking about with the pull-up resistor. Um, the button was an active low, so there's an actual resistor sitting there holding that line up, P90, to 3.3 volts. Um, electrically, how this works, You've got the 3.3 volt rail, and it's tied to that resistor. There is no current going through that resistor, or very, 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 very little current. Um, so little that you could say that there's zero voltage drop across that resistor. If there's zero voltage drop across that resistor, then that line is sitting at 3.3 volts still. So that line will stay at 3.3 volts until I push the, the, the grounding button. When I push the button, it ties it to ground. Now there's a lot of current going through that, that uh, resistor. In fact, there is V over R current going through that resistor, and you get a 3.3 volt voltage drop across that resistor. With a 3.3 volt voltage drop across that or that uh, resistor, you have 3.3 on top and zero on bottom. It pulls that pin 90 down to zero. I know this is a super um, early stage concept, but you know, if you if you're just working with FPGAs or you're just getting starting like started like I was when I started this, um, then it's something that that uh, you have to stop and think about just for a moment, get it clear in your head, and then move on. And that's one of those things, man. You use pull ups and pull down resistors all over the place, especially when you're working with logic. So we'll go ahead and stop this video here. Um, look for the next video uh, to continue on with this series. Uh, I think up next we'll be working with the um, let's see working with the sequencing and getting uh, multiple LEDs to light up. So we'll see you when that, uh, that next video comes up. Love well.